This is agreementism number four. This is our fourth and final message in the series of agreement. And we're going to go to our key verse here, which is Amos chapter three, verse three. And it says this, can two walk together unless they are agreed? Agreement is the qualifier of compatibility. You cannot walk together. You cannot occupy the same space at the same time without being in agreement. There's incredible power in agreement. Now, today we're going to talk about the magnetic power of thankfulness. <laughs> I knew that's what was going to happen. See, I get it. You're, you all were just tempted to check out right there. Like, oh, good. How predictable. A, thank, a being thankful message the week before Thanksgiving. You know, you're like, I've heard it all before. I don't need to hear it again. It's very predictable. But today I'm going to offer you a money back guarantee that this message will challenge your ideas about thankfulness in ways that I bet most of us have never thought of before. So re-engage. Don't assume you've heard it before and get ready because we're going to talk about thankfulness. I know that many people are like, well, we've all heard it before, preacher. Trust me, you've not heard this before. This message was not an afterthought to end the series on the week of Thanksgiving. This is where we were headed from the beginning. Weeks ago when we started into this thought about agreementism, this was the definition. This was not just a, hey, because of the holiday, let's talk about being thankful. That's not what happened. I need you to understand that, that this was the destination from the beginning. But before we could get here, I needed you to understand the power of agreement. I needed you to understand that true repentance is first and foremost being in agreement with God about what sin is. You can be sorry for sin, you can apologize, you can feel remorse, you can attempt to change in and of yourself, but until you come into agreement with God about what sin is, you're not really in repentance. And it's important for you to understand today's message that you have to understand that first and foremost, repentance is, in, is being in agreement with God. I needed you to understand that God commands us to be reconciled, not just to be forgiving. In week number two, we, we talked about how Jesus gave us the instructions that if we're bringing our gift to the altar and we suddenly remember that somebody's got something against us, to leave our gift at the altar and then what? Go and be reconciled with our brother. Now, forgiveness can be done in isolation. You can forgive somebody that doesn't deserve it. You can forgive somebody that doesn't ask for it. But reconciliation requires agreement. You cannot be reconciled unless the two of you are in agreement. Agreement is required for reconciliation. I also needed you to understand that no matter how Pentecostal you are, you're not truly walking in the Spirit without being in agreement with the Spirit. You may think you are, but if you're not in agreement with the Spirit, you're not walking with the Spirit. So today, I want, I'm going to show you thankfulness through the lens of agreementism. Now, what many of us don't understand is that thankfulness is not something that you choose. <laughs> what? Thankfulness is not something that you choose. In fact, many of you would argue with me and say, false. Not only is thankfulness something that we choose, it's something the Bible commands us to choose. Now listen, you can choose a thankful disposition. You can choose to say the words, thank you. In fact, let's just try that right now. Everybody say the words, thank you. Say thank you. Thank you. See, that was a choice. You chose to move your mouth, flap your gums, and say the word, thank you. But that has nothing to do with whether or not you actually feel thankfulness in your heart. Do you see the difference? You can choose the behavior of gratitude. You can choose gracious behavior, but that does not mean you're actually thankful. Being truly thankful is not a choice. I'm telling you today that most of us believe that we can choose 
to be thankful because we're operating under the belief, we're operating under the assumption that thankfulness is a choice that we make. But let me help you argue with me. <laughs> I don't do that often, so relish the moment. In 1 Thessalonians, we read in, in chapter 5, verse 16, it says this, always be joyful. That's a choice. Never stop praying. Obviously, a choice. Be thankful kind of seems like a choice. In all circumstances, for this is God's will for you who belong to Christ Jesus. It seems like a choice. It sounds like a choice. It might even feel like a choice. And I could quote literally dozens of verses like this one where we are commanded and encouraged to be thankful. So how is it that I can tell you that being thankful is not a choice? Thankfulness is not a choice because it is the byproduct of other choices. Did you hear me today? Thankfulness is not a choice because it is the byproduct of other choices. It's kind of like, you ever heard people say happiness is a choice? Some people just choose to be happy and some people choose to be, you know, miserable sour pusses and want to make everybody else miserable too. I mean, you understand that, right? And we assume that being, that happiness is a choice, but happiness isn't a choice. Come here, let me smash your foot with a hammer. Let's see how good you are at choosing happiness. Happiness is often a byproduct of the, of the circumstances and our reaction to it. Happiness is not a choice, it's a thousand little choices. It's the choice to make the right decision at one point in our life so that down the road, we're happier about it later. Are you with me? Happiness is not a choice. It's a byproduct of other choices. And in the same way, thankfulness is not a choice. It is the byproduct of other choices that we make. Okay, now I can see you're skeptical, but hang in there. What we're going to do is we're going to take that thought. Everybody take the thought. Just grab it. You're not grabbing it. What are you doing? Grab the thought. Come on, work with me, people. I'm going to preach a lot longer if I'm all alone. Grab the thought. And set it on the shelf. Just take it, set it on the shelf. We're going to come back to that in a few minutes. Okay. Now, this whole series has been used through the analogy of magnetism. So we've talked about how magnets work, how a compass works, the magnetic field around the earth. Come on, that's pretty awesome, right? There's a magnetic field around our earth and we, this is not debatable. We know this has been proven. It's how the compass works. Last week we talked about all kinds of cool toys you can buy, including a thousand dollar Batman toy that levitates like half an inch. You know, I'm so surprised nobody messaged me this week saying that they purchased one of those. I couldn't believe it. We think that we understand magnets and the power of magnetic fields, but let me tell you something. Magnets are way cooler than anything that we've talked about so far. This is an MRI. Xander, if you could put up that MRI machine. How many of you have had the, the pleasure of being put into one of those machines? Raise your hand. Yeah, this is an MRI, otherwise known as very scary machine that you probably have a problem if you need to get in one of those. According to the National, listen to this, according to the National Institute of Biomedical Imaging and Bioengineering, <laughs> this is a real place. I mean, do, Am I the only one that wonders how smart do you have to be to work in a place called the National Institute of Biomedical Imaging and Bioengineering? I'm guessing you got to have a pretty good education to get in the door. And wouldn't it be funny to, to have that be the place you see somebody pushing on a pool door? <laughs> I imagine there's some really, really smart people that work there. But listen to this. According to the National Institute of Biomedical Imaging and Bioengineering, magnetic resonance imaging, or MRI, is a non-invasive imaging technology that produces three-dimensional, detailed anatomical images. It is often used for disease detection, diagnosis, and treatment monitoring. We know it's a medical device. It's a fancy doohickey that helps doctors figure out what's going on with us, right? But how does an MRI work? Well, let's keep reading. 
MRIs employ powerful magnets which produce a strong magnetic field that forces protons, did you know that's what was going on? Protons in the body to align with that field. That's awesome. Physicians are able to tell the difference between various types of tissues based on these magnetic properties. That's awesome. So the MRI, the thing that's looking inside your body to see what's going on, is using powerful magnets to align the protons. Are your protons out of alignment? The protons in your body, and it creates a magnetic resonance image that helps doctors see what otherwise cannot be seen. So in other words, doctor use, doctors use a powerful magnetic field to see that which cannot be seen. Are you following? Are you picking up what I'm laying down here? See, we talked last week, we, we think we understand what a magnet is. It's a compass that points north. It's a cool toy. That, it's things that stick to a refrigerator. We think we understand the potential of magnetism when really it's so far beyond what we're capable of understanding that most of us don't even scratch the surface. How many of you understood that the protons in your body were out of alignment and needed a powerful magnet to line it up so the doctor could figure out what was going on with you? The only thing I knew about MRIs until this message was that it was about $800 to look inside my wrist. That's what I could tell you about an MRI. And that's after insurance, by the way. Without insurance, I think it was a lot more money. This powerful magnetic field, it exposes. Everybody say exposes. It exposes what's going on inside of our body. With this magnetic technology, nothing is hidden from our doctors. It's pretty powerful. Now, let's go to the Word of God and let me show you something that's also awesome. In Hebrews chapter 4, verse 13, it says this, Nothing in all creation is hidden from God. Everything is naked and exposed before his eyes, and he is the one, the one to whom we are accountable. Now, I don't think that's gonna, that's no big revelation to most of us in the room that everything is exposed to God. We see that. But we saw a moment ago that through technology that was, is relatively recent technology to mankind, we're able to see through the, a living, the only way a doctor could see inside a body before that was to cut it open, right? To, 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 Peel the skin back and have a look. Now we're able to look inside the human body in incredible detail because of this magnetic technology. We're naked and exposed because of this technology. And of course, that's in a good way if you're sick. So how can we get a glimpse of what God can easily see? We're all in agreement, right? That God can easily see us from the inside out. There's nothing we can hide from God. We are naked and exposed. Can I get an amen? amen? Okay. How can you and I get a glimpse of what God can see easily? Let's go back just one verse from verse 13, and it says this. For the word of God is alive and powerful. It is sharper than the sharpest two-edged sword, cutting between the soul and the spirit, between the joint and marrow. Listen to this line. Look at this line. It exposes our innermost thoughts and desires. Now imagine reading something like that really only just a few hundred years ago or thousands of years ago when it was written. The idea of being exposed in our innermost it would just be un unrelatable. Now we have this technology that is able, is sharper than a scalpel, sharper than a laser, doesn't even have to cut us open, can look inside our bodies and see what's going on. So you might be asking, what is this? This is great, Pastor Jeremy, but what in the world does this have to do with being thankful? You see, the word of God is the MRI. Thankfulness is like the protons that have to align to that magnetic field and produce a magnetic 
resonance image. In other words, thankfulness exposes the image that's really going on inside. I mean, you can fake it for a little while, but how many of you know you can't fake it forever? How many of you know when somebody's being phony when they say thank you and they don't mean it? Sure, we've all seen that. We've probably all done that. Because, and the reason we've done it is because there are moments when we know we ought to be thankful even though we're not, right? How many of you have ever told your kids, I, you just shut up and say thank you? Come on. Why? Because we're instructing them that in spite of the fact they don't feel thankful, they need to be thankful with the hope that the practice of thankfulness will generate a harvest of actual thankfulness later on. That's the hope anyway, right? But when we get older, just faking it doesn't do anything. We can say thank you, but that don't mean we mean it. The only thing that changes whether or not we mean it is when our, what's going on on the inside changes because that's where thankfulness comes from. If you're not thankful, if you're not a thankful person, you can't fake it forever. But if you want to become thankful, just saying the words thank you, putting a fake smile on your face, does not make you thankful. You have to change what's going on on the inside, and when you change what's going on on the inside, you will then become thankful. Are you with me? Let me show you this. Let me show you why we should be thankful. Are you with me? Okay, First Chronicles chapter 16, verse 34 says, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, his faithful love endures forever. That should put a smile on your face right there today. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His faithful love endures forever. Let me give you another one, James 1.17. All generous giving and every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights with whom there is no variation or the slightest hint of change. Come on, who's excited about that? Who's thankful for that? How about one more? Hebrews chapter 12, verse 28 says, since we are receiving a kingdom that is unshakable. Did you hear what I just said? Since we are receiving a kingdom. How many of you have a kingdom on your wish list? Well, like it or not, you're getting one. We are receiving not just any kingdom, but an unshakable kingdom. Let us be, what's that word? Thankful. And please God by worshiping him, worshiping him with holy fear and awe. Now remember what I said a moment ago, that thankfulness is not a choice, it's a byproduct of other choices. So go ahead and grab it off the shelf, bring it back, we're gonna talk about it now. <laughs> you see, Chronicles said to give thanks, why? Because God's faithful love endures forever, right? So being in agreement with God that he is faithful, being in agreement that his faithful love will last forever. Being in agreement with that statement produces a byproduct of thankfulness. Do you hear me? You don't just choose thankfulness. You choose to agree and understand and believe and be excited about what God has promised us. And when we agree with that, when we believe that, when we understand that, when we have the hope of that, when it's real, are you with me today? You can't even help it. You just are thankful. It just overflows from you because you're excited and you believe that what he said is the truth. And if we're not thankful, guess what that means? Hello? Whenever our thankfulness has escaped you, Whenever, just a show of hands, how many of you ever not felt especially thankful in any particular moment? Yeah, we all have. Whenever our thankfulness has escaped us, guess what else has escaped us? The sight of his faithful love. <laughs> Stinks, doesn't it? But it's awesome. Whenever we lose sight of how great God is, his faithful love. And we get focused on stupid stuff, like our pleasure, our stuff, 
things in our life, the worries of this world. Stupid, temporary, pointless stuff. And we let it derail us, get us all messed up, angry with other people, discourteous, unkind. Why? Because thankfulness has escaped us. And what else has escaped us? The sight of his faithful love. James said that every good thing worth having is from God. <laughs> Did you hear that? Every good thing worth having is from God. Every good thing worth having. How many of you like grapes? They're from God. How many of you like iPhones? From God. How many of you like to drive around in a car instead of riding a horse? From God. How many of you like getting to Florida in a couple hours thanks to air travel? Yeah, that's from God. Every good thing, every good thing, every good, I don't, know you're I don't think you're grasping the word every here. Every good thing comes from God. All the good stuff. Think of something good. Go ahead and do it. Think of something good. Okay, that, that comes from God. All the good stuff comes from God. That's what the Bible says. Agreeing with that statement, believing that statement, produces a harvest of thankfulness. Are you with me? And when we start to believe that we are the source of the good things in our life, guess what leaves? Thankfulness. But when we agree with what the Bible says, that every good thing is from him, a natural byproduct of that agreement, you don't have to pick it. You don't, have to, you don't have to focus. You don't have to, I have to be thankful. You just are thankful. It just happens. It's not a choice we make. The choice was to agree that all the good stuff was from him and not me. That was the choice. Thankfulness was a byproduct of another choice. So you can choose to say thank you. You can choose to have behaviors of courtesy. But real, true thankfulness is not something you can just choose. It's a result of the other choices you make. Hebrews said, since we're receiving a kingdom that is unshakable, let us be thankful. So if you think this is as good as it gets, this is as good as your life's going to be right now, this world, this kingdom that you currently possess, if that's as good as it's going to get for you, and you believe that heaven is just some eternal church service, God help us all. If that's what you think is coming, you're not going to be thankful very easily. In fact, you're going to hold on to this with a white knuckle grip, believing that it can't get any better and it only gets worse. But when you believe the truth, when you know that what we are getting is an unshakable kingdom, not just a, a kumbaya, we're not playing harps and floating around on clouds wearing diapers. That's not what's coming. We are going to rule and reign with Christ for all eternity. And when we understand that, when we believe that, when we agree with that, it produces a harvest of thankfulness. You just, you, you, it, just, it just flows out of you. I don't care what President Trump does or any other president does. I don't care if they bomb this place back to the Stone Ages. I know what's coming. Do you hear me today? I'm not worried about who's winning the next election. I'm not worried about what, which news network is lying and which one's telling the truth. They're all lying. <laughs> I'm not worried about any of that. I'm thankful that in spite of all that nonsense, I'm going to receive an unshakable kingdom. So being thankful comes from the choice to believe and agree that God's word is the truth. Amen? Thankfulness is part of the MRI of our souls. It sees right through us. Nothing will test what's really going on inside of you like thankfulness. It exposes what's really going on. 
Our thankfulness is a magnetic resonance image of what's happening inside of us. I don't know if you think that's cool, but I think that's awesome. So let me ask you a question. Are you blessed? I knew that's exactly the response I knew I was going to get. Smiles and nods. Because you're at church. It's the week before Thanksgiving. Of course you're going to say you're blessed. It would be inappropriate not to. You'd be a real prude if you'd say, well, not really, you know. No one's going to say that sitting here. Maybe some people watching on the other side of a screen might, you know, be like, well, not really if you knew my life, you know. But you're all here in person. You're going to say you're blessed. That's too easy. It's too easy of a question. So let me ask the same question another way. Are you blessed enough? Most of you have still said yes, but it's not as easy a question. In other words, let's spin in a couple different ways. Are you satisfied? Your satisfaction is the demonstration that you believe that you are blessed enough. Are you content? Your contentment. It's a magnetic resonance image of your belief that you're blessed enough. Because if you're discontent, that means there's something you're, that you believe you're missing, you deserve, being cheated on, don't have yet. If you're unsatisfied, there's something between you and being blessed enough. It's easy to say we're blessed. It can be difficult to say whether or not we're blessed enough. So what's this, answer this question, what is it that you need to be really blessed? <laughs> if you're not quite blessed enough right now where you're sitting, what is it, just, just think about it, you don't have to tell me about it, what is that thing? Is it a bigger house, a better job, nicer car, better iPhone or smartphone? <laughs> what is it that is standing between you and being blessed enough? Let me ask you some other questions. Is a person who lives in a million dollar home more blessed than you are? Trickier question, isn't it? Because I know if I wasn't asking this question right here in this context, you might give a different answer. How about somebody who lives in a shack with no running water and no electricity? Are they less blessed than you are? That's probably the hardest question of all. You don't know which way to answer. If I say yes, then I'm a stuck-up snob. But if I say no, then I miss the point of the message and I know it. <laughs> Is somebody who has less than you, are they less blessed than you are? You see, it all depends on your definition of blessing. You see, this is, in fact, why I morally object to the, the prosperity gospel message. It was a, was a whole movement many years ago. It's still around a little bit today. It's the, the teaching that God wants you to be rich. It's really good at making those preachers rich. <laughs> but listen, it's a... It's a bit of a quandary because I do believe that God wants you to be blessed. The Bible says I've never seen the righteous forsaken. I've never seen his children begging for bread. So there is some merit to the idea that God wants to, will in fact promises to provide you with natural resource, which we would you know, likely interpret to be money. Are you with me? But the problem with prosperity gospel teaching is it takes your attention off of the word of God and discipleship and becoming more like Christ and hyper focuses you on getting more stuff. It forces you to pick a lane that material blessing is the definition of blessing. You see, God doesn't look at blessed the way many people do. We look at our practical definition of being blessed is having more money than we're capable of spending. The problem is we're kind of awesome at spending lots of money. And the more money we get, we get awesomer at spending it. So it's a, it's a never-ending 
deal, right? The more money you get, the more money you need in order to feel like you're blessed. Naomi and I, we had a crisis this week, a crisis of thankfulness, really challenged us down to our core, questioned what's right and wrong in the, the fabric of the space-time continuum. And I know you're going to feel very sorry for me when I tell you what it was. We pulled up to our house and pushed the button that opens the door so we can drive into the house, and it didn't work anymore. Our garage door opener died. Go ahead. Come on. Aww. I know you feel really sorry for me. I've ever, have you ever wondered what it would be like to go back in time like 200 years <laughs> and try to explain to a person at that time what a garage door opener is? No, 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 no. See, it's a button. Well, it's not just a button. But it's a button that I have in my car. Well, okay, you don't know what a car is. Okay, a car, it's like a horse, but I can get inside. It's got a heater. It's got a radio. No, it's not cold. I don't have to wear a coat. I get in my car, and then I take it into my house. Why would you take your horse into your house? I don't know why you would take it, but I've I got a button in my car that lets me open a door so I can go into the house without having to be outside, and I can close the door so that my, my tender little flesh doesn't get exposed to the elements. I mean, can you imagine what it would be like trying to explain to somebody from a few hundred years ago what a garage door opener is? And nevertheless, I had to go buy one because I couldn't go a couple of days without one. I saw snow on the floor. Oh, we got to have that. I'm going to go down to Home Depot. So, we're blessed. We have a new garage door opener in our house. But this was a crisis. I mean, doesn't it seem silly? Am I the only one that thinks this is stupid? What do we need a garage door opener for? How is it that some, for some version in my mind, I was not blessed enough? If I had to get out, drive in, shut the door. How many remember those big one-piece doors that come down and it'd like take your legs off if you were standing in the wrong place? Slam! Our definition of blessed is constantly evolving and changing. If your smartphone broke and you had to use a payphone, you'd think God had forgotten you and abandoned you. There'd be weeping and gnashing of teeth. My point is that I don't think God measures things that way. I'm grateful that I got a new garage door over. It's pretty cool. <laughs> I'm grateful for that. But I can tell you right now, it's not a big deal. The problem is the way we measure blessing and the way God measures blessing is usually very different. You see, if the choice that you have made is that those who have more than you are more blessed, if those people are more blessed than you, then thanksgiving will be replaced with envy. You won't have thankfulness You'll be envious. And as long as you insist on comparing yourself to other people, you will always measure your blessing based on that comparison. You hear what I'm saying? As long as you have what other people have, your sense of blessing will remain stable. But the moment you feel that other people have more than you have and you somehow feel that that is unfair, thankfulness will be replaced with envy. If on the other hand you believe that you are more blessed than those who have less than you, if you think that you're luckier and you are more blessed than people who have less than you have, then thankfulness will be replaced with pride. Thankfulness won't be the byproduct. It'll be pride. Where there should be thankfulness will be a proud spirit, almost a smug self-righteousness that is, I hate to say it, extremely common to those of us who live in this great country. The reality is God does not measure blessing the way we do. The reality is, is that nobody chooses to be envious. I mean, have you ever got up one morning and said, you know what? I'm just going to envy other people today. Those ungrateful rats, I'm going to envy what they have. Nobody does that. 
Nobody deliberately chooses to be proud. These are byproducts. They are the magnetic resonant image of the other beliefs we choose. The choice to believe that we're more blessed, the choice to believe that we are less blessed, produces a byproduct of either pride, envy, or genuine thankfulness. When we come into alignment, when our protons are in alignment with God's word, and we realize every good gift. What day of the week is it? Anybody? Anybody? Sunday. Good. Thank you. Glad you're with me. Your Sunday is a gift from God. Stop whining about whether you get Monday or not. Just be thankful for Sunday. None of us in this room, not one of us, is promised a tomorrow. Yet we often measure our sense of blessing based on how long our life is. And when somebody dies at an age that we feel is too young for that to be appropriate, we act like somehow they were cheated. Not necessarily. The reality is all of our days are numbered. There is a number attached to the days we have. The only right response we have is to be thankful with the ones that we're giving. Let me leave you with this. Second Peter chapter one, verse three says this. By his divine power, God has given us everything we need. Now, notice the words that come right after that. Don't say everything we need to be cooler than other people. Everything we need to be as comfortable as a person can be comforted. It says, God has given us everything we need for living a godly life. If we will come into agreement with that verse and accept and trust and believe that God has given me everything that I need. Everything. The natural byproduct of that choice is thankfulness. It's just gonna come pouring out of me because I'm thankful. It's not the choice to say thankful, to say thank you. It's the choice to believe that I have everything I need. I'm just like you. I want nicer stuff too. I have an iPhone 6, by the way, which if you know iPhone speak, that's basically an antique. You know, it's almost worth more. It's so old. It's going to be on display somewhere because, you know, in iPhone years, it's ancient. Do you think I wouldn't mind having the newest one? I wouldn't mind. But I look at it and see that's $42 more a month and I'm like, I don't need that because I have all that I need. Are you with me? Come on, are you with me today? Being thankful for my iPhone 6 does not come because of what it is. It comes from the belief and the understanding that I have everything that I need. The byproduct of that belief is thankfulness. And I'll close with this verse, 1 Thessalonians 5. We read it before. It says, always be joyful. That's a choice. Never stop praying. Obviously a choice. Be thankful in all circumstances for this is God's will for you who belong to Christ Jesus. The way you choose to be thankful is by getting your protons <laughs> into alignment with the MRI of God's word. And that thankfulness will produce a magnetic resonance image to reflect what's really going on inside. Amen. Amen. 